you gotten the videos? Have you been able to see those at all? Are they showing up? Okay. Well, they should be posted on Blackboard if you ever need to go back and review stuff from class. Um, all right. Percent composition. Two ways of talking about composition. One you're most used to, which is the first one, the numbers of its constituents at of its constituent atoms. I don't know why there's an and there. So something like oh and number two, yeah. We think about water as H2O, meaning that each molecule of water has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Right. But when you talk about an actual substance or how you would measure an actual substance, it doesn't really make sense to do it this way because you can't see the atoms. So you have to measure these things by weighing. And that way we talk about percent composition, which is the percent by mass. So water is, you know, some, rather than saying two hydrogens and one oxygen, we say water is X percent hydrogen and Y percent or whatever, oxygen. This is much easier to measure uh, from a physical standpoint. You can take a sample, you can break it down into its elements, weigh out how much you get, and that gives you a mass percent. Um, but to convert between the number style and the percent style, we have to do a little bit of math using the molecular weights. Because we can't say, for instance, that water, and this is, this is a common mistake, you can't say that water is 60% um, hydrogen and 30% oxygen, or 60, you know, two-thirds hydrogen and one-third oxygen. That's, what, that's how it goes by numbers, but that doesn't make sense by mass, because hydrogen, the element, is much, much lighter than oxygen. So we have to figure this out um, using those percentages. And here's how you do it. We're going to do a couple together, and then you're going to practice some make sure that we all know how to do this. So for water, what we're going to do is find the overall formula weight or molecular weight. And we'll just use whole numbers. What is the molecular weight of water? 18, 18 grams per mole. Right, that's each hydrogen is 1 and each oxygen is, is uh, 16. And then we know that hydrogen is one gram per mole and oxygen is 16 grams per mole. So to calculate the percent by mass, we simply divide the mass of each element over the total mass of the compound, assuming one mole. And since we're doing percents, you can assume that one mole. So I'm going to use the color coding here, hopefully, to make it clear. So to figure out the percent by mass of oxygen, we're going to take 16 grams per mole, which is the mass of oxygen, and we're going to divide it by 18, which is the mass of the whole compound. Uh, and that gives us 0.89 or 89%. And then for hydrogen, we're going to do the same thing. Percent hydrogen, there's two of them times one gram per mole each. Again, divided by the formula mass. And that comes up to 11%. So water is 89% oxygen by mass and 11% hydrogen by mass. Okay? Does that make sense how that sort of works? All right. So for the next one, rather than going through every single element, um, although that might be something you want to do for practice, let's just look at oxygen. How would you determine the percent by mass, the percent composition by mass of oxygen in barium sulfate? Okay. So what? Right, so each oxygen is still 16, right? So that's going to be 16, and then there's four of them. And we divide that by the overall mass of barium sulfate, which is uh, 233 grams per mole. 
and that comes out to about 28%. So barium sulfate is about 28% oxygen by mass. OK. Um, why don't you do the same thing for methanol and caffeine on your own? Find the percent by mass of oxygen in methanol and in caffeine. The total of all mass percents must equal 100. So if you're ever not sure that you're doing it right, you can get, if you, as long as you look at all the elements, that's a nice kind of way to check your answer because you can see if they actually all add up or not. Okay, so I'm going to ask you now to think about this in this final problem. But I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. It says calculate the mass percentage percent composition of nitrogen in each nitrogen containing compound. That's great. Uh, you should be able to do that. Make a little mark maybe to, to work on that um, as you're doing your homework. But I want to ask you one more thing. Uh, one, one thing a little bit different. I want to ask you to rank these by mass percent of nitrogen from least to most. Which one has the lowest mass percent of nitrogen? Which one has the highest mass percent of nitrogen? And I want you to see if you can do it without doing any calculations. Just thinking about it, estimating it. Which one do you think has the lowest to highest mass percent of nitrogen? The reason why we're doing it this way is this is the sort of thing that would come up on a multiple choice exam, especially like on the final. They might not say calculate the mass percent. They might just say which one has the highest mass percent, or rank them. And if you can do it by just thinking about it and looking at it, rather than having to go through all the numbers, you save yourself a lot of time. So let's think about that. Everybody kind of get, think about it, get some answer in your head, try to write something down where you're ranking these from lowest to highest uh, percent nitrogen, and then we'll see how, how it goes. Which one did you think has the least amount of nitrogen by mass percent? Probably D, right? And then what? And then what? And then what? A, OK. Um, all right. How certain are you about that? OK. All right. Well, you're right. You're right. How did you figure this out? Just by comparing masses, because you know oxygen is 16 and nitrogen is 14. Yeah. So the masses of, or if the elements stay the same, then you can use the number, the numbers in the formula to actually get this, because they're going to be uh, proportional. How do you think? Um, now nah, we'll get to that later. But okay, good. So this, these sorts of things are what you want to be doing in your head so that you can check your numbers. So let's say you actually went to calculate these things out and you weren't doing it right. One way you maybe weren't doing it right is you got the opposite numbers for some reason. If you looked at it and you thought, hey, wait a minute, this one should really have the highest amount of nitrogen, that might be a good check on whether or not you had gotten it right. So always good to think about these things and think if your answers make sense as instead of just remembering OK, I have to do this step, then I have to do this step, then I have to do this step. All right. Elemental analysis. This thing, anybody know what this thing is? Not quite. Not quite that fancy. This is called inductively coupled plasma. Um, and what it is, is it's a super high energy um, beam of plasma, pla or plasma torch, they call it. Anybody know what a plasma is? Physics folks here? What is a plasma? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's ions. It's a charged ion. It's, it's actually considered um, kind of a fourth state of matter where you have three electrons in a matrix of ions. So rather than a gas, which would have whole atoms, you just have ions with electrons kind of floating freely. And so it's a very, very high energy situation. This is like what's in the sun and, and that kind of thing. Um, extremely, extremely hot. And what this machine does 
is you can put a sample in there and it is, has so much energy that it excites all of the um, electrons and then allows and then allows you to determine what molecules or what atoms are actually in your sample and how much of each there are, there is. We have one of these upstairs actually. Um, it's the big giant thing in the instrument room if you ever saw it. It's like the biggest thing besides the one on the floor. It's up on a table. But you'll use this in uh, 122 uh, quite a bit if you go on to the next semester. And this is how you determine the formula or one way you determine the formula of an of an uh, of a compound from a, an actual sample. So the thing that we just talked about, the mass percentage, the reason that's important is you can get a sample, you can calculate or you can measure the mass percent with instruments like this, and then you can actually figure out what the formula is. So you can figure you can sort of the backwards problem of what we just did. When you know the percents, you can figure out the formula. So you can figure out what you have. And to do that, we just need to talk about a couple definitions, and then I'll show you how to do these types of calculations. First, empirical formula is the smallest whole number ratio. So ethane, for instance, is C2H6, but the empirical formula is CH3, because you can divide 2 and 6 by 2 um, and get the smallest number. So the empirical formula is all this, always the smallest numbers that you can have that has the appropriate ratio. The molecular formula is some integer multiple of the empirical formula, and that's the actual number of atoms in the molecule. So like ethane, it's not correct to say that ethane is CH3. There are a lot more than one carbon and three hydrogens in ethane. There are, in fact, two carbons and six hydrogens in that molecule. So that's the molecular formula, the formula that actually describes it. Normally, this is all we really care about, the molecular formula. Where the empirical formula is important is in calculations like this, because we can, we can only get the ratio. Empirical formulas and molecular formulas will have the same mass percents, the same ratios of elements. Uh, so you have to have some other information to actually get the molecular formula. So here's an example of this. And um, those of you with biology or biochem experience, don't spoil the answer, because you probably know this. But here's the sort of thing that you might be able to calculate here. Glucose has an empirical formula of CH2O. But glucose is actually a bigger molecule than that. Its molecular mass is 180. What is its molecular formula? So what you have to figure out is how many CH2Os go in to that molecular formula. And that, the way you do that is like this. Figure out the molecular weight of the empirical formula. So you've got carbon, which is 12, you've got two hydrogens, and you've got oxygen, which is 16. So we add that up and get 30. So CH2O is 30 grams per mole. And then you say, all right, well, how many times does that go into 180? Six. Six times 30 is 180. So that means the molecular formula is CH2O taken six times. Okay. Which a less uh, awkward way of writing that out would be to say, to actually distribute the six and say that this is C6H12. O6. And that's the molecular formula of glucose. Yes, we're going to do one. We're, um, we're going to do one next, but actually we're going to make it a little bit trickier first. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> but I think it'll get the same idea. Oh, yeah. Uh, let, let me draw that out. Thank you. So you take the molecular weight is 180. So 180.16 divided by the 30 from up here 
tells you that there must be six of those in the overall molecular weight. Yeah, good question. OK, so now we get a little bit trickier. That's getting the molecular formula from the empirical formula. But what if you don't even have the empirical formula? What if all you have is the mass percent? So I'm going to go down to the problem first, and then we'll come back up to these steps on how to solve it. So here are a bunch of steps. But here's what a problem would look like. And I'm going to give us a little bit of room here. Um, here's what the problem would look like. The elemental mass percent composition of ibuprofen, which is given over here, is 75.69% C, 8.80% hydrogen, and 15.51% oxygen. Determine the empirical formula of ibuprofen. This is actually not a ridiculous question in terms of life. I mean, you may or may not need to do this, but if you have any sort of job ever that requires quality control, analysis, um, anything like that. You, you may find yourself using these sorts of things, um, using mass percents to get back to empirical formulas. Like we were just looking at some data for a lake thing that has nothing to do with chemistry. It's just like some community thing that I'm involved in. And people had to figure out how to do this. And you know, so I was like, oh, I can use that, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to go through this. This is one of those problems where you just have to do it a bunch of times. So you get the practice, and you get the steps down, and then you'll get it. Here's how we do this. So first, you base the calculation on 100 grams. We're just going to pick that, because it makes all the numbers easy. Um, let me show you what that means. So first, we assume 100 grams. So that means. If we have 100 grams of this stuff, how many grams of carbon are in there? Right. 75.69 grams carbon. See why that 100 grams made things easy? Because we can just turn those percentages right into masses. So that means we have 75.69 grams of carbon, 8.80 grams of hydrogen, and 15.51 grams of oxygen. So now we go to the next step, which is determine the number of moles of each element, each element present in 100 grams of compound using the atomic masses. So we're going to say, all right, here's step two, 75.69 grams of carbon is how many moles? How do we figure that out? Divide by the mass of carbon. So we know that carbon is, and we'll just use Banagers to be easy, 12 grams per one mole gets us to about 6.31 moles of carbon. And we're going to do the same thing for each element. So now we know the moles of each one. And now that we have moles, because remember mole is a number, we can do a ratio and figure out uh, what the empirical formula is. And the way we do that is the third step. Divide by the smallest number of moles, which in this case is what? The 0.97. And that's going to give us some numbers. 
I mean, we already have some numbers. It's going to give us some different numbers. So 6.31, which is carbon, divided by 0 0.97, 6.5. So that's for carbon. Uh, 8.80 divided by 0.97 is 9.07, and that's hydrogen. And then, of course, 0.97 divided by 0.97 is 1, and that's oxygen. So this tells us that in the formula of this compound, it's about, it's, it's 6.5 carbon to about 9 hydrogen to 1 oxygen. So we're almost there. The problem is an empirical formula can't have half an atom in it. Right? They have to be all integers because you can't have half an atom in a compound. So you multiply to get all the whole numbers. So our last and final step. Right. Multiply to get whole numbers. And in this case, that's going to be by 2, depending on the problem. It could be by whatever. Usually it's not a huge number. If you find yourself multiplying by a huge number, then you probably either did something wrong or you can round. Did you ever round? Yes. So if it's pretty close, round to the nearest whole number. And by pretty close, I usually mean within about a tenth, thereabouts. If it's more than a tenth, maybe you need to, do, to multiply it. But if it's within a tenth like this one, this should round to nine. Uh, but this is six and a half, so that doesn't round. So that means we've got, if we multiply everything by two, we've got 13 carbons, because six and a half times two is 13. Uh, we've got 18 hydrogens and two oxygens. So that's our empirical formula for, for this molecule. <laughs> The other thing you want to do at the end is check to make sure that this is actually the smallest irreducible set of numbers. Because there's a chance that in your multiplication or something, you end up with numbers that are way too big. You can always just divide them down later. But in this case, we have an odd number for carbon, so we know this is the smallest. We can divide it down. If they were all even numbers, we would divide them down again, or all divisible by 3, or whatever. OK, so that's the empirical formula. That tells us the smallest numbers of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that we can have to represent the ratio. The next step then is, is it also, or is it the molecular formula? Or do we have to multiply that empirical formula by some number to get the um, molecular formula? Now to do that, we need more information. And the key part here. is the molar mass. You can't determine the molecular formula unless you know the molar mass, because you need to know how many times that thing has to go into it. So in this case, let's calculate the molar mass. Um, no, I don't have the molar mass. But I'll tell you, if you count up all the carbons and hydrogens in this molecule, this is actually also the molecular formula. OK. There's one more type of um, way that you can do this. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, let's do a practice first before we get into something new. Let's do a practice first. So here's how one of these, another one of these problems. And you, you can try this. Let's say a compound has. Um, Twenty-four and a half. I think this is from your book. Twenty-four and a half grams of nitrogen. Seventy point zero grams of oxygen. Find its empirical 
formula. This one's only different in that instead of giving you percentages, you're given masses. So go through those steps, either alone or with people, and see if you can kind of follow the same procedure we did and come up with an empirical formula. So that's great. Should we go through it or? Really seem good? All right. In this case, if you, I'll just kind of show you the, the answers of each step. If you convert these to moles, you end up with 1.75 moles of nitrogen and 4.38 moles of oxygen. Then we're going to keep kind of these steps. Then you do the division, and you end up with um, kind of N1O2.5. But since we know that you can't have half a mole, you have to multiply that by 2. So your empirical formula should be N2O5. Well, you don't know. Because it just says a compound that has these masses. So it could be. It could be, given this data, it could be either N2O5, N4O10, whatever. So N4O10 would be like the molecular formula, pretty much? It could be. If, I mean, that molecule doesn't exist, but it could have been with this data, yeah. You'd need to know the molecular mass to actually get that. But assuming this is actually the molecular formula also, what would the name of this compound be? Dinitrogen pentaoxide. Good. It's, it's covalent compound, right? because it's just got non-metals, nitrogen and oxygen. So you name it with both prefixes of, of how much there is of each thing. All right, one more. Um, this is a little bit trickier, but it's also less important, I think. And that's combustion analysis. Combustion analysis is kind of like um, empirical, is determining an empirical formula, but rather than using something like an ICP, you simply burn something that is, meaning you react in, in oxygen fully, and then you measure the byproducts, which are carbon dioxide and water. To do combustion analysis, all you have to know is that you start with some kind of a hydrocarbon, C, X, H, Y, O, Z, whatever. Maybe there's some nitrogen in there too. Who knows? And you react this with a certain amount of oxygen, as much oxygen as will possibly react with it. And then you form some amount of, of water and some amount of carbon dioxide. This is a standard combustion reaction. Um, so this would be combustion of fossil fuels or other types of hydrocarbons. And what you do is you measure the amount of water and carbon dioxide that comes out. And from, from the water, that gives you the amount of hydrogen. And the carbon dioxide gives you the amount of carbon. Then you can subtract that here and get the amount of oxygen. So you can end up figuring out your x, y, and z based on how much water and carbon dioxide comes out after combustion. So here's how a problem like this might look. Let's say that a 0.8233 gram sample, and this one is, is in your book also, of some hydrocarbon produced upon combustion. 2.445 grams of carbon dioxide and 0 0.6003 grams of water. And the question is, find the empirical formula of the original, or find the um, molecular formula of the original hydrocarbon. So to do this, we kind of go through the same process, but instead of using the moles of the individual elements, we have to use the moles of these molecules, water and carbon dioxide. So it looks like this. Um, two 
2.445 grams of carbon. And we're going to convert that first, oops, grams of carbon dioxide. Let me make sure we're labeling this properly. We're going to divide this to find moles, but instead of dividing by 12, this is actually carbon dioxide, so we have to divide by 44, which is um, Forty-four grams of CO two in one mole. All right, so that's the molecular mass of carbon dioxide, and that gets us. I'm going to cut off a couple decimal places here just because it's easier to write. But you know, if this were actual numbers, you'd want to keep your significant figures appropriate and everything. So that tells us the moles of carbon dioxide that we got out of this combustion. And then we do the same thing for water. We take our water. And this is how much water we got out in moles. Okay, now we have to find the moles of just carbon and just hydrogen because there's, we don't want the oxygen. It's going to mess up those ratios that we do later. So how many moles of carbon are in each mole of carbon dioxide? One. Just one because there's one carbon atom per molecule of carbon dioxide. So we, this also is now 0 0.056 moles of carbon. What about water? How many moles of hydrogen are in one mole of water? Two, because there's two atoms of, water, of hydrogen per water molecule. So that means we have to multiply that by two, and that gives us 0 0.066 moles of hydrogen. Yeah, in each molecule of carbon dioxide, there's one carbon atom. But in each molecule of water, there are two hydrogen atoms. So to actually get the moles of hydrogen, you have to multiply double the moles of water. Like if you imagine, if you had, let's say, a dozen water molecules, you would actually have 24 hydrogen atoms, because there'd be two per molecule. So you have to do the same thing with moles. Quick question. Yeah. Are we only going to find like oxygen, or is there going to be well, you kind of always do it the same way. Yeah. It doesn't get any more complicated if there's other stuff. You just can't find the other stuff. So you have to be given more information to get inf more information. But if it's just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, you can do it this way. And that's usually what it will be. OK. So now we, we go back to grams. And the reason we go back to grams is because we need to know, we actually need to know the um, number of moles in the original of, of uh, let's see, how am I going to say this? We need to know how much oxygen was in the original sample. So now we know how much carbon and how much uh, hydrogen, but we don't know how much oxygen, which was part of the question, right? So we have to now put these back into grams so that we can go back and get the oxygen from this original sample. So the next step is can put these back into grams. And then we're going to subtract those from the original mass to get the amount of oxygen. So that's 0 0.056 grams of carbon times 12 grams per one mole. Whoops, divided. This is wrong. Moles of carbon times 12 grams per one mole. tells us that in that original sample, there were 0.67 grams of carbon. And then we can do the same thing for oxygen. So 0 .0, or hydrogen, I'm sorry, 0 0.066 moles of hydrogen times 1 gram per 1 mole is 0 0.0.
zero six six grams of hydrogen. Now the original, the mass of the original sample, I need another color here, was 0.8233. So we say 0.8233 grams, the mass of the original sample, subtract the mass of carbon and the mass of hydrogen that we just found. And that's going to be 0.087. So we'll say 0.087. Let's label this so we know what we're talking about here. So this has mass of the original sample. And if we subtract out the mass of carbon, and the mass of hydrogen, whose mass are we left with? Right, so this, what we're left with is the mass of oxygen. All right, now we have to figure out how many moles that is of oxygen so we can have moles of carbon, moles of hydrogen, moles of oxygen and finish the calculation. So now that we know there's that much oxygen, We can divide that by the mass of oxygen, 16 grams oxygen per one mole. Uh, gets us about 0 0.056 mole oxygen. All right, so now, actually, let me color code this so it hopefully makes a little bit more sense, maybe. So now look what we have. We have the moles of carbon, the moles of hydrogen, and the moles of oxygen. All that other stuff was just to get the, this number, this moles of oxygen. So you got moles of carbon, moles of hydrogen, moles of oxygen. Once you have all the moles, then it's the same as before, right? Once you have the three different moles, you do this division and get the formula. All this other business or more profane word if you prefer, is meant to get moles, 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 so you can actually do this division. So let's actually do this division. Now that we have all the moles, we can say for carbon, that's 0 0.056 divided by the smallest, which is 0 0.0056, and that equals 10. For hydrogen, We've got 0 0.066 divided by 0 0.0056, which is 12. And then for oxygen, we've got 1 because it's this divided by itself. So that's 0 0.0056 divided by 0 0.0056, which equals 1. So that means that the formula here must be C10, H12, O. All right? That's the empirical formula. All right. So that's clearly complicated and a lot of steps, right? Let's break it down one more time just in descriptively. We had the mass of the sample and the, the carbon dioxide and water produced. From those two numbers, we got the moles of carbon and the moles of hydrogen. Then we put those back together to get the grams of oxygen and then the moles of oxygen. And then it was the same as before. We did our division to get the empirical formula. Okay? So let's talk about how to learn this and how not to learn this. How not to learn this is to stare at this page and try to remember what to do each time. And maybe and like make a flashcard of the different steps or something. That's how not to do this. It's not a good idea. It's never a good idea to study notes or study the book in this class. What is a good idea to do? Practice. Practice. If you do ten of these in a row, you're gonna want to kill yourself, but you're gonna know 
what these steps are. You know, I, that's probably a little extreme. You're going to be bored and a little sad, probably hungry, and maybe tired. But you will know this because it will be in your head because you've just done it 10 times in a row. So that's really the key here. And the same with the, um, the calculating the empirical formula in the other way also. Just do it a bunch of times. Go through all those problems in the book, and, and you'll have it. And it'll be fine. All right. Uh, 10 minutes, right? Or five minutes? Five minutes. Let's introduce this, and we won't actually get into this stuff till Wednesday. All right, this is a, another time where I'm going to kind of assume that you know a little bit about this. So if you don't, um, you really need to come to me or ask these things um, so that I don't go too fast. Have you seen chemical equations before? Yes. OK, good. A chemical equation tells you what happens in a chemical reaction. Right? You combine these things, you get this thing. You mix these things, you get this thing. Left side we call reactants. Right side we call products. And then this is called a chemical reaction. So the reaction is the thing that actually happens. The equation is the thing that you write. That's writing a chemical equation that describes a chemical reaction. OK. And then, of course, we know conservation of mass, right? Atoms are neither created nor destroyed. That's the guiding principle in writing chemical equations. And given that principle, what is wrong about that first chemical equation described um, at the top there? Yeah, the way we've written that, what we're saying is two hydrogen atoms bound as a hydrogen molecule and two oxygen atoms bound as an oxygen molecule come together, form water, and one oxygen atom disappears. It's gone. Of course, that violates the principle of conservation of mass. You can't just have stuff disappear. So what do we have to do? Should we just say, well, the oxygen wasn't involved, so it's just sitting there? Is that, because now, now it works, right? Now we're not getting rid of anything. Is that the correct way to do this? No. Why not? Yeah, this is actually describing a different process. The process that was described did not account for this magical free oxygen atom, which, by the way, would be highly reactive and a big problem to simply be floating around. So you can't add stuff to chemical, react to chemical equations or you're actually changing the nature of the reaction. What can you do? You can change the numbers of things that are, that are given here. And by doing that, you put a number out in front of them. So what, one thing I might do. And we're going to talk about how to do this in detail in a bit, um, is put these numbers like this. Now what I'm really saying is I'm taking two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule, and those are making two different water molecules. And that's OK. What about this? Now everything's accounted for. What about this? Why can't I just do that? Wouldn't that be easier? What's wrong? Why doesn't that work? It's balanced, right? It's not correct, but why isn't it correct? Anybody know? That's right. This is a different compound. This is actually hydrogen peroxide. This is not water anymore. So by doing this, we've changed the nature of what's actually happening, what's being described here. And if somebody wanted to write a chemical equation that described the formation of hydrogen peroxide, maybe they would do that. But in this case, we're making water. So we can't change these numbers down here, or we actually change the nature of the compound itself. That's why we can only change the numbers of the molecules that are put in uh, to the reaction. All right. And actually, yeah, let's balance these other ones, too. Are the other ones balanced? Which one isn't balanced? Yeah, the second one. How do you know it's, well, let's go a little slower. How do you know this is not balanced? That's right. So there's one carbon on each side. That's OK. Two oxygen here and three over here, right? 
And then there's four hydrogens here and just two over here. So that doesn't work either. All right, so now what we have to do is, is again, change the numbers so that they actually do um, balance out. And it looks like this. We're going to go through some, some rules as to how to do this probably on Wednesday. Now, the main thing here, so before we go on, the, you should never get these wrong. Or, okay, let me, fix, let me change that. <laughs> you should never get them wrong thinking that you got them right. Why is that? You can always check. You can always look at that and say, okay, now are there the same numbers on each side or are there different numbers on each side? If there are different numbers, it's still wrong. And maybe you run out of time or something and you have to turn it in anyway. But you know that it's still wrong if there's different numbers on each side. So in, in some way, this, these are some of the easier questions because you'll always know if you've gotten it or not. Right. Okay, let's stop there. Uh, we'll get into this more on Wednesday.